Adults, how you guys doing tonight? Are we excited? Okay, good, good, good. Tonight's going to be a great night. Thanks for having us in. Can we give a hand for the worship team? Man. And I know you, you all probably do this every single week, so this isn't anything new. But could we give a hand to uh, Rob and Kyla for their incredible love and leadership for you guys? I know you probably thank them every week, but let's just do it again. Man, we're grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, like uh, Rob said, my name's Andrew Perez. Uh, my incredible wife, Kelsey, is sitting at one, two, three, third row. You can raise your hand. We're super excited because a lot of things are changing. We are uh, having a baby in March, we hope. I mean, we don't, babies come at like whatever time they want, so we're hoping for March, and if not, we'll just call a quick audible. Uh, but don't pray for us for parenting and stuff. We have that all figured out. We don't need any prayer for that. Uh, this is our first child, so uh, we're taking that baby then in August, 8,000 or so miles around the world to a country called the Philippines, and that's where we're going to be starting a, a brand new chapter of our lives. And so we're super excited for that. Uh, I'll share a little bit about us, maybe some things we like. Maybe you'll notice that we have some things in common, or maybe as I'm sharing, you're like, uh, yeah, I hate this guy. Get him off the stage. Uh, it's up to your discretion. First thing, we love Asian cuisine. Anybody here, like, you can throw down some sushi. Any, any okay, I get a couple head nods. Uh, dim sum, we were just having a conversation, so if I don't see a head nod over here, we're going to throw down right now. Uh, ramen, any ramen? Okay, this is, I don't know if you've had it, this is pretty incredible, one of Kelsey and I's favorites. Pho, Vietnamese pho? Oh my, this is, maybe this is a hot topic, I don't know. Pho or ramen? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, oh, all right, then let's pray and wrap this up. Um, <laughs> No, like, uh, we just, pretty much anything Asian, we love to consume, and so it helps that we're moving to Southeast Asia, because there is a blend of all of that there, so we're grateful for that. Some hobbies that Kelsey and I like to do, uh, maybe a little bit different for, for each of us, but, you know, we, we found, you know, what we like to do. Kelsey, she's an incredible bread baker. She can make a sourdough boule like nobody else's business. I didn't even know any of those words before I met her, so that's awesome. Another word, I didn't even think about this, duvet. Does anyone know what a duvet is? I'm like, I didn't even make my bed in college, so I didn't even know what a duvet was. Most of the guys here are like, what, what kind of dish is that? That's like, so Kelsey has definitely enhanced my life in a lot of different areas. I do, just between us, don't tell, I hate the duvet. I mean, it is such a pain. Okay, no, we're going we're gonna to move on. Um, we, uh, well, a hobby that I like to do, I've just gotten into it for the past six months or so, chess. Anyone play chess in a building? Cool, yeah, that's normally the response. Um, I'm alone in that one. We got one? Oh, is that the Arizona person too? Wow, this is, just, what a great night. Uh, let's see, what, what else do we got? Uh, Kelsey is from Missouri, like Rob said, also known as Misery. But Kelsey, she's, no, she's shaking her head. I'm from Arizona, which is like, if you grow up in Arizona, the place that we did, we like didn't even know like bodies of water existed. It's just like flat desert. So people talk about a beach. We think about like, oh, it's just as mythological as a unicorn until we finally made vacations out here to California. So California's got a special place in my heart. We always went to Disneyland. That was just the thing that we did. But uh, that's just a little bit about us. I'm going to share just maybe to kind of get into uh, the focus of the message tonight, a little bit about my story, how I got involved with missions, because sometimes, even for me growing up, I didn't grow up around a lot of missionaries. I, I really didn't even know it was a thing. I didn't know it was something that you could do. I, I guess I never really stopped and like thought, like, man, does Christianity, does a love for Jesus exist all around the world? And if so, how, how in the world does that even happen? And, and so part of my story was I grew up uh, in a home where my, I, we have all of the benefits really of being a generationally Christian family, uh, but that really didn't happen until my parents uh, got saved. And so they kind of got together and uh, but right before, or maybe it was right after they got married and they're like, man, we don't know what it looks like to raise a family to love Jesus or to follow God, but we, we want to try. And I truly think that that was uh, an incredible thing that Jesus really honored. It's just this simple obedience, this willingness, this like humility before God that's like, man, we, we have no idea what we're doing. 
Uh, we don't really have a, a lot of examples in our lives to, to model after, but we want you to do something with our lives. And so the incredible thing is looking at all of our family, like myself and my brothers included, all of us love Jesus and in some form or fashion are, are serving him faithfully and attending church. And then now my older brother is, is raising his family to love Jesus. And it's because I think God is so incredibly faithful and he's honoring simple obedience and humility. But I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Maybe you're, you're like me or couldn't relate to this story. Is Growing up, man, everyone seemed to have it figured out. Like even from like, like first graders, you know, you would be in class and maybe like the assignment for the day was to write your future occupation and then draw a picture of what you wanted to do. Man, that's like the most stressful time of my entire life. And I'm like a kindergartner, first grader. You know, these kids like... I want to be an astronaut. And you're like, bro, you eat your boogers. There ain't no way you're going to be an astronaut. But like at least they had some sort of idea. And I remember like time after time after time, I'm like, I've got no idea. Like not even the slightest clue. And then like you go into high school and you feel like you have to have your entire life planned out. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm a, I'm a senior. I'm about to graduate high school and I have no idea. My life's over. Uh, and you have more time, as you guys know. Uh, and I remember I just had no clarity. Like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And so there were actually times, and this is maybe a window into to how my mind works. Like, there, there were times I can remember vividly in high school, nights where I would just cry. Because I, I'm that type of person. Maybe you're like me. We're like, I need a plan. I, I, I love to have vision. I love to think forward. And I love to, especially being saved at a young age, like, I love to, to just vision cast, especially for the things of God. But it seems like God wasn't giving me clarity. Like, I, I've got no idea what I'm supposed to do, and God, you saved me at such a young age, but why do I feel so, like, lost right now with, with no direction? And so it was uh, even during a time in my life where there was a portion of my life that was just honestly filled with pride. Like, I was following Jesus in all of these areas, but this one area of my life, which I was in just a not-so-great relationship, and I knew it, but I didn't want to hand it over to God because I'm like, I got this figured out. And so there was this time of my life where there was both like, God, would you please show me what you want for my life, while at the same time, I'm not going to give you full control of every single area. And it wasn't until I was truly humbled by God, and he allowed me to go on a, a missions trip to the Philippines, and I remember like, oh my goodness, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I had never spoken before in front of people. I'm just naturally an introvert. So anything that you're like, oh, Andrew, like, oh, you're kind of fun to talk to. That's a glory to God because I'm a stick in the mud. Uh, but like God has done some work in me. But I remember going over to the Philippines. I'm like, I'd never shared a single message or been in front. Like I've never led a single thing. And uh, I remember finally getting there with Lance and Melanie, which are the ones that we're going to be working with uh, when we get there. And he was like, man, I am so excited you're here. And I'm like, me too. And he's like, I've got six speaking engagements for you. And I'm like, okay, my armpits are sweating. Like, this is, uh, is it too late to get a, you know, a flight back home? And I remember the very first time, I'm like, it was probably the absolute worst message ever. And uh, we, we were having this uh, youth kind of rally together. It was in this uh, mall, really kind of rundown mall and not really any air conditioning, incredibly humid. We're talking like 90% humidity. And you like walk back this like ill-lit hallway. You go up some stairs all the way to the back. And then this like last room, you walk in, I mean, way smaller than the room we're in. And the only thing in there, I mean, there's no like fancy lights. There's like a screen, but then there's this like single oscillating fan, which I'm almost like, I I'm pretty sure it was just there for decoration because you don't feel any type of breeze. And I gave the absolute, probably worst message ever. And I'm just like, whoa. Yeah, there's, there's no way God could use that. Like that was absolutely terrible. And, you know, you, you, you do what you can. I, I kind of prepared and gave a message. And then I'm like, man, is there, is there anybody that would want to surrender their lives to Jesus? And I'm like, at this point, it's like, we're just we're going to Hail Mary this. Because I'm like, there's nothing, it feels like salvageable about what I just did. And I'll never forget, um, there was a, a Filipino uh, who kind of wrapped up the end of the message. I'm like, there was, I mean, no hands. There, I mean, it was, there was nothing there. And then I remember just after, I mean, it was like maybe 10 minutes after the message, um, the missionary Lance kind of pulled me to the side and he's like, Andrew, look at this. 
and we kind of peered behind this corner, and there were three girls, and two of which were just bawling. And it was because somehow God used somebody as ill-trained as me to speak his word and change somebody's life for eternity. These two girls gave their life to Christ. And I just remember that moment so vividly, and, and Lance said, man, don't ever forget this moment that God would use people like us to do something seemingly as foolish as speaking to change people's lives and change their lives for eternity. And I remember I came back, and I was like, oh, my goodness. I didn't even know somebody could be a missionary. I, I, again, we're going to be the first missionaries in our family. You might have heard me say that this past Sunday. But it's just this reoccurring theme in my life that either when God humbles me or on like the really rare off chance I get it and I humble myself before God, then I see these incredible things happening in my life. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about today is just understanding this, this virtue or this idea of humility. It's, it's escaping. Like it's not a popular thing. Like when we look at like the world today, when we look at, I mean, competitions, when we look like even like climbing some sort of social ladder or some career, like humility is not something that is like honorable. In fact, oftentimes the, the opposite is, is being taught. And when I look back at my life, I'm like, man, I wonder how much further along I would have been if I would have just humbled myself before God. If I would have truly given every crevice, every area, every relationship in my life, if I would have just humbled myself before God and said, man, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Would you help me? I wonder how, how much further I would be. I remember talking with one of my good friends. His, uh, well, this is being recorded, so maybe I won't say his name. But I was talking with him, and, and he was just, he's going through it, like a really difficult time in life right now. And so he was asking me just questions about, he, he's not a believer, he doesn't believe in Jesus, and he was just asking me questions about, you know, what I thought and how, why it seemed like I had life together or why I had answers, and I, I really don't. It's just God working through us. But I remember just kind of being plain with him. I'm like, hey, I, I'll be honest. Christianity, the things that Jesus teaches, they're very offensive because at the heart of it, what it says for me, what it says for you, is we actually don't know what we're doing with our lives. We have no idea what's best for us, and we don't pursue the things we should, and we actually need to surrender everything we have. I mean, our future careers, our emotions, the way we spend our money, our relation, like every aspect of life needs to be surrendered to God because we actually don't know what we're doing. And he's still not a believer, but you could tell that just those conversations were like perplexing him. And maybe you're somewhere there tonight as well where you're like, man, the things that I've been doing, the choices I've been making, the things that I thought were going to bring me life, they're, they're not. I, I would just maybe at, through the reading of God's word tonight just ask you to consider maybe the answer isn't like another seven-step program or it's not like, you know, more self-love. Like maybe the answer tonight is us recognizing that we don't have all the answers and that we actually, all we need to do is humble ourselves before God and ask him to take over. Because then God gives us clarity. God gives us a renewed purpose. God is reminding us as children of God our identity. But this all comes out of humbling ourselves before God. I want to read a passage if you've brought your Bibles tonight or if you've got a phone with those type of capabilities. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9. We're going to read through verses 46 uh, through 56. I'll give you some time to turn there. Uh, essentially tonight, like I said, all we're talking about, which maybe isn't a popular thing to talk about, is humility. It's, it's humbling yourself, which is difficult to do because it seems like when you think you've got a handle on humility, it's like, oh yeah, well, I just, I, I was pretty darn humble today. Oh, dang it. Like, like you mess up. Like it, it seems like a fleeting thing, but it is something that should be strived after daily, and when we are humbling ourselves before God, it is wild, even just looking at my own life, the type of clarity, purpose, and answers that are then revealed to me when I finally just admit, Andrew, you don't know what you're doing. You don't have it figured out. Don't lean on your own understanding. And so we'll begin reading in, in verse 46. It says, Now an argument started among them, this is the disciples, as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus... Knowing what they were thinking in their heart, 
took a child and stood him by, by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. And John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder them because uh, he was not following with us. And Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. Now it happened that when the days of him had been taken up, uh, were soon to be fulfilled. He, sent, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him, because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Before we get into maybe explaining what some of these verses mean and, and, and trying to apply those to our own life, uh, let's, let's just pray and ask God to, to help us. I mean, let's practice quite literally what we're going to be reading uh, and ask God to do what we can't, to humble ourselves, to understand exactly uh, what we need to do in our own lives. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your goodness. We're grateful for your word. We're thankful that uh, we can gather in a room like this to learn about the ways in our lives maybe that we need to change. And it's certainly not easy. They, looking at my own life, Father, the times that I've had to be humbled by your word or by godly influences in my life or even by you have been some of the most difficult times of my life. But the fruit from those have been incredible. So we're asking that in this time that we get to read your word and, and reflect on the things that you say and the examples that Jesus put before us, would you help us to humble ourselves? And then from that, would you give us direction? Would you give us answers to maybe some of the things that maybe we haven't even vocalized to our closest friends? And ultimately, would we be able to see that the path of life, of, of salvation and freedom is found in the perfect person, Jesus. We love you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So uh, Kelsey and I were in New York, and we uh, just missed because we were attending a church service, but there was a New York marathon that was happening. Uh, another popular one that you might have heard of is the Boston Marathon. So this is a race that is, I mean, it's hosted by several cities, but of course, the most famous one is, is in Boston. And uh, believe it or not, the Boston Marathon, you run a marathon. And so like, this is like, an, it's an incredible feat. Like I, I can't even probably walk a marathon, but like these people, like they, they train and they train and they train. Like we're talking about qualifications for running in the Boston Marathon start two years prior. So you're not just going to show up one day, slap a number on your chest and start like running this race. Like it just doesn't happen that way. They're, two years prior, you got to start prepping for this. But uh, these qualifications, I mean, they're, they're pretty incredible. I don't, maybe this isn't incredible for you. Maybe you're like a freak of nature athlete and you run all the time. So you're like yawning. But in order to qualify, you got to have like an official time. Are you ready for this? A full marathon in three hours. Some of you guys, I mean, you didn't say dang because you probably have never ran a mile, so you don't know how impressive. Like, this is insane. Like, three-hour marathon. That's just to qualify. And nonetheless, like, some guy who has broken a record, we're going to look at his photo. But here's the thing. When you compete in the Boston Marathon, there are prizes. Like, there are rewards that you're, that you're aiming for. And I've, I've seen, I don't know, like, how official this is or, like, how much taxes take out. But the first place winner can get $150,000. Like, that's insane. Not insane enough to get me to start running, but that's still, like, pretty impressive. And so, like, here's the thing. If you're going to win this $150,000, what you got to do is you got to run faster than everybody else. It's pretty simple. You've got to be ahead. You've got to be number one. Everybody else has to be in your rear view mirror. Like, you've got to burn everyone out. And so this guy did. This gentleman did. I believe his name was Evan. I mean, this guy ran the Boston Marathon. I mean, what, what, we're talking like, is it 26.2 or 25.2? 
26.2 miles in two hours and six seconds. I couldn't do that in a car. Like, this is insane. He surpassed everybody else. And in surpassing everybody else, he got his reward. I mean, I mean this is, I know, this isn't mind blowing to anyone else. You're like, okay, Andrew, you run a race, you get first, you get the prize. But um, I just, I'm trying to get us to understand this is the way that our world works. Coming up in, in just, what is it, maybe a week, less than a week's time, what, what is, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to watch it. The Super Bowl. Okay, not a lot of football fans in this place. Is anybody, uh, Kelsey, you're rooting for the Chiefs? Yeah. Go Missouri? Okay, let's just get a, a you know, hand raised. Who's going for the Eagles? Okay. One, is that one person? Okay, and uh, the Chiefs? All right. Okay, and then this one, maybe we'll relate. Raise your hand if you don't care. Okay, I feel you. I know, yeah, right? Who's rooting for Rihanna? You know, like this is like, in order to win the Super Bowl, to be the best team, to be the greatest team, you've got to beat the rest. You've got to be ahead. I mean, thinking about even like careers or sports or races, like you name it, you've got to claw your way, climb your way to the top using the less talented as a stepping stool if need be. Like this is how you become the greatest. This, this is how we scale greatness. And this is something that these disciples, man, they, they were talking about, and they talked about it quite often. Like, this isn't the only time in, in Scripture that we see these disciples talking about this very same thing. It's like, man, who's the greatest among us? And maybe you're, you're not like the type of person where you would actually argue about this, like with your friends. That would be like, you probably wouldn't have very many friends if you sat them down at Starbucks and you're like, look, Let's be honest, I'm the greatest. Like that, that probably, it just wouldn't be a very comfortable uh, coffee date. Anyone going on coffee dates and that's your opening line? How great am I? Like that, it just doesn't work out. It's probably why you're single. But like, this is insane. Like and when we're talking about greatness, this was on their minds so many times that Jesus flips the script in a way that I think is still so profound and so against the way that the world works today. Jesus doesn't shy away from really what they're thinking about, but instead answers their thoughts, their uh, arguments, but it's in a way that's completely counter to anything that they ever thought. See, I think it's important for us to know, leading up to this conversation, what has happened before. See, Jesus, in like an incredible state of vulnerability, talking with the gentlemen who were closest to him. Like these are not only his friends, but his disciples, the ones he was teaching. And he, now this is the second time, the first time is, is in the 20s, like the verse 20, 21, 22. Jesus is vulnerable with them and talks about how he's about to die. That's pretty heavy. Like this is a conversation that probably should require some people not to talk a lot, but just to kind of listen, maybe uh, to comfort Jesus in his time of vulnerability. Like if, if I go uh, and, and maybe with some of my closest friends, think about this, not my wife, don't think about this, she'll start crying. But like if I told my friends like, hey dude, I, I think I'm about to die. Somebody get Kelsey some tissues. No, like if I told this to my friends and their response then after that was the ones of the disciples, like, yeah, Andrew, that's cool and all, but you think I'm the greatest? I'd be like, did, did, you, not, did you not just hear me? I'm about to die. And your concern on your mind is, are you greater than I am? Or like this, it's just, it's insane. Like how, how does this, how is this what comes out of the mouth of the disciples, especially right after Jesus now for the second time is showing and telling them that he's about to give his life up. And their response then in verse 46, now an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. So they've been following Jesus for some time now and a lot of them given up their careers, given up their homes. And, and so I imagine what's on their mind is like, man, I, I just want to see Jesus like completely take over. I'm like all, all of the oppression that the Jewish people are facing. Jesus could just at any moment radically change the way that we're living and establish his kingdom right here, right now. And they're probably thinking, yeah, if he does that, man, where are we going to be? Like, how are we going to rank? 
And, and so this, this kind of pride starts welling up in them as they're literally putting forth arguments as to why they are better than the other disciples. I mean, this is going back and forth. These disciples who were supposed to be unified, working together for the cause of Jesus, are now being broken up and disjointed because they're concerned with, man, what about me? What about my life? What about like, how great am I? Where am I going to end up when Jesus' kingdom is established? And so you see, now Jesus is going to, I'm like the, the expert, the most master class type of thing you could be exposed to. Jesus gives them an illustration, but I think it rocks their world and even rocks the world that we live in here today. But the first thing for us to know, especially in our own lives, I mean, this, these are things that we're thinking of. We, we have aspirations. We, we want to know where we're going in life. We want to know what the future holds. We, we, to the best of our ability, try and plan it out. And, and maybe even the relationships that we're in, like we want to know what comes next. We, we want to live a life that's great. I don't know if anybody woke up this morning and is like, man, I hope my day is like really mediocre. Like I just have a mediocre breakfast, meet up with my mediocre friends, and then come and hear a mediocre speaker. One of those you might get, but like no one wants a mediocre life. Like you want to experience great things. You want your life to count for something. You want to be like people to not have to lie at your funeral, to like make stuff up about you. Like you want to actually live a great life. And Jesus gives us a recipe for that, but the answer isn't in pride. So throughout uh, us just walking through this passage, uh, we'll move through it more quickly, but we're going to be highlighting some, some ways that pride, I would think, shuts doors or even clouds our vision to the things that God wants to use us for, for the opportunities that might lie ahead. Like thinking about the most exciting opportunity in my life is to be married to my wife and us to get like working together in a foreign country to share the truth about Jesus. Like that is insane. But God had to humble me first. Even today, like preparing for this message, I have my friends like texting me like, man, what, what things can I pray for? And I'm like, to be honest, like we're talking about humility and I just feel like an incredible hypocrite. Like I, I, don't, I don't have it all figured out. I still, I mean, to, today, I'm still struggling with pride to think that maybe I could craft this message in such a way where you would pat Andrew on the back. Pride destroys community, but humility establishes unity. I mean, the main thing that was, I mean, breaking up, trying, trying to, to halt the things that Jesus is trying to get accomplished and, and use these disciples for is they're, they're concerned about themselves, the, the pride. It's, it's getting in the way. And then Jesus gives them an incredible illustration, verse 47. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a, I mean, like you think like, what, what would Jesus show? Like this is the thing that we should be like. The, the greatest person should be like this. Maybe like a shield because it's so strong or like a rock because it's like a great like foundation. Or maybe Jesus even could have used himself as an example. Instead, Jesus takes a child and makes him stand by his side. And he said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, him who sent me, for the one who is least among all of you is the one who is great. Jesus is saying, if, if you want to be great, you've got to be like a child. Because they're this child wasn't so ambitious to get this worldly honor or worldly praise or get on this, this power trip of, man, which one of us is going to be? Instead, the child is meek. It's very limited in what a child can do. A child needs the help of its parents to survive. It's humble. And this is flipping the script because they're like, wait a second. Like our whole lives... The things that we've been viewing, the examples that we've had are these people who have been having to climb up to the top. I mean, if we think about the religious leaders of the time, like everything they would do would be in public so that they could get a pat on the back. But Jesus is saying, if you want to be great in the eyes of God, which I think is so important, we've got to be humble. And John, I mean, like Jesus, an incredible teacher, 
probably maybe even spoke about it more. I, I don't know. But thinking like right after that, maybe our first thoughts would be like, oh man, there's so much I've got to change. I got, I'm not humble in all the things I do. But I think John maybe responds in a way that probably we would and in a way that I know I have before. John answered and said, yeah, master, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and we, we tried to hinder him because he, he's not with us. So, like, in other words, like, this pride, instead of, like, realizing, oh, man, I'm, I'm not like that, you, like, kind of push the blame off or, or shift the focus onto somebody else. And, I mean, pride does this. Pride redirects correction onto or towards other people. But humility takes responsibility. It's, it's almost as if he missed the whole point. It's like, oh, that, bring, that brings up a great point. Yeah, there was somebody I saw who was trying to do good things for you, Jesus, but he wasn't with us, so I stopped him. Don't worry, I, I got it. it. It's like he missed the whole point. And then it goes on, Jesus says, but Jesus said to him, do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. Now it happened that when the day for him to be taken up were soon to be fulfilled. So remember, Jesus, he's told them twice now within one chapter that he's going to die. He's going to give his life up. Jesus is the perfect man, the perfect representation of humility. Jesus, I'm, in, in Philippians 2, it's kind of even a baffling thought for us to wrap our head around that the God, the creator of all things, became man, like took on the, the nature of, of man, like became man, fully God, but became a man. That's humbling in and of itself, but then his entire life he used as a sacrifice to pay for the sins that he didn't commit, but that man committed against God. And Jesus did that willingly. Jesus is the perfect example of that. And Jesus it says those days were soon to be fulfilled. He set his face to go to Jerusalem which is, I think, an incredible point to say Jesus had an unwavering pursuit to humility. Namely, the biggest example of humiliation in history. That this fully God, fully man would die a shameful death for the sins that he didn't even commit. Jesus had his face set toward Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of them, and, and they, when they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. So the Samaritans, like, they, they had beef. Like, the, the Jews and the Samaritans, they, they didn't really get along very well. We don't have time to get into the extent of that. But there was, I mean, tension there. And it says, but when they did not receive him, this is in verse 53, because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord... Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Like forgetting the conversation that they just had not that long ago. The point to prove that they weren't humble. They, they weren't this elite class. That they too needed to humble themselves. But then they shift attention on to other people. And now they've come into uh, a village with Samaritans that they looked down upon because they were a mixed breed, you could say. They weren't pure Jew. And he's like, oh, Jesus, they didn't receive you. They didn't welcome you in. Do you, do you want us to call down fire and consume them, these terrible people? And you see the pride rise up again. Pride seeks or sees the wickedness in other people. But humility sees the evil within me. It says, Verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Like if we're thinking about Jesus' teaching, Jesus' life, and then the two, I mean the illustration that we got, and then Jesus moving on to this other village, I think the theme is abundantly clear. Like if we had to summarize the entire night tonight, when we're uh, trying to align our lives to be more like Jesus, or we're looking for opportunities in our lives, or, or we want to know what's the next step that I can take, I think this is it. That greatness in God's eyes is measured by humility. 
That's what he's looking for. Like if, if, if we're looking at like my life and Kelsey's life and you're like, oh, but you got, you're missionaries. Like you're, you're great. Like we're, we're nobody special. But I think what God is going to use is simple obedience and people who know they desperately need God. I mean, this is how our relationship with Jesus begins, is realizing that we don't have it all together. We can't live perfectly. We can't live a sinless life. We've sinned against God, and because of that, we deserve punishment. We deserve wrath. But Jesus lived a sinless life, and he died on a cross for our sin, who was the perfect example of a perfect, humble man. And if we would humble ourselves and ask Jesus to save us and trust in his work and trust in his sacrifice, then we'll be saved. I mean, the, our relationship with Christ begins with humility. And then to see progress in our life is a daily, daily step away from pride and towards humility. I put together 10 questions as, as we're getting close to closing it up tonight. 10 questions to expose a prideful heart. I mean, these, these are ones that rocked my world, and Kelsey and I read over them together, and we're like, wow, uh, we suck. But like, this is like a, a list that's like, man, I don't have it all together. The, the list isn't for us to look at and to say, oh, I, well, actually, I've, I've done that. I do that well. I do that. But it's like to expose, man, we desperately need help. I mean, the life of a Christian, the, the life of Scripture should show us, I mean, it's incredibly offensive, that we don't know how to live our lives apart from God. Every time we take control and we take the wheel and we make these plans that are about uh, our own benefit, like destruction comes about. So maybe you'll get as messed up as I did as we read through these. Number one, uh, 10 questions to expose a prideful heart. Do I regularly think of myself as more spiritually mature than others in my life? Number two, do I struggle to humbly learn from others, especially those who are less educated or experienced than me? Number three, Am I quick to find fault with others and then verbalize those thoughts to them? Do I frequently correct or criticize others? Do I have a hard time admitting to God and to others when I'm wrong? Do I tend to be controlling of my spouse, my children, my friends, or in the workplace? Do I get easily hurt if my accomplishments or my actions of, or acts of service are not recognized or rewarded? Is it hard for me to let others know when I'm in need or need help? Number nine, am I sitting here thinking about how many of these questions apply to somebody else? Number 10, am I feeling pretty good that none of these actually truly apply to me? Like these questions should reveal in our hearts that we're not assuming our Christ-like calling. And if I'm looking at my own life, the, the patterns, and patterns in which God was incredibly gracious to me, it all began with humility, with him humbling me or a godly influence in my life, pointing out something that I was blind to. But it's not an easy thing because the world says if you're going to be great, you've, you've got to step on people and get to the top and forget about them. You do you and you live out in your career. It's you, you, you. And then the teachings of Christ come along and say, yeah, if you're going to be great, you've actually got to become humble and the least. So then this quote by Keith Christensen reads this way. Pride is at play whenever there is self-reliance, self-promotion, self-service. Instead of relying on God and exalting God and serving God, we don't often consider these ugly true colors of pride. But this is what pride really is. At the bottom, seeking to put self in place of God somehow. See, we see that pride is not just rebellion against God. It is actually a kind of rivalry with God. And God treats the proud in this way. He opposes the proud. He must. This is what is right and what is good because he is and there is none beside him. He is God alone. Man, if, if we want to see God work in our lives, if we want to believe that God could use us for greatness, I think it begins with a posture of humility. 
So just as I gave you 10 questions that might reveal a prideful heart, here are 10 actions that you could do today. I mean, the entire list is probably a little bit overwhelming, but maybe if we just picked one, just one step closer to the heart of God, that he might reveal the next path for us or begin to heal things in our lives that maybe we haven't told a soul. The first, routinely confess your sin to God. And then this one's really difficult. Acknowledge your sin to others. Number two, react to wrongdoing patiently. Number three, remain submissive to authority, to the good or the bad. Number four, respond to correction and feedback from others graciously. Remind yourself of the servant's mindset. Receive from someone with lower accolades. Number seven, seek reconciliation. Be quick to forgive. Rehearse gratitude. Cultivate a grateful heart. Recite encouragement often, or in other words, purpose to speak well of others. And lastly, reckon pride as a condition that needs daily correction. I don't have all this together. And that was probably most of my battle, especially leading up to this message, is I really, I I don't have any foot to stand on. I still struggle with this. But I can testify to the goodness of God and his faithfulness to me, especially when he would humble me. Because it seems like then I would begin to make progress. I would begin to understand things in my life. I would begin to get answers in my life. But it began with humility. Because although it's different from the world, in this race for greatness, everybody wants to be great, Jesus says the greatest champions, the winners, the one who will get the great rewards are the ones who finish last, the ones who prefer other people, and the ones who humbly admit they need the help of a savior. Let's pray.